So everyone, welcome to another Floor Life webinar. Today, we are discussing fair trade in the floral industry. And our Floor Life hosts are Mark Allen, our global product manager and sustainability experts, and Alan Tenoy, our director of Global Wholesale Channel. We have two special guests joining us as well today, but Alan will introduce them to you shortly. Um, I just want to mention that the webinar is being recorded, just an FYI, and that we would like to invite you to ask us questions. So there is a chat function on your screen. Feel free to send us any questions you have during the presentation. Um, we're going to collect them all and we're going to try and answer as many as we can at the end of the webinar. So don't be shy to send us in anything. It's you can send it to all panelists or to all panelists and attendees. I'm going to hand the floor over to Alan. Take it away. Okay. Thanks, Georgina. So, hi. Uh, welcome, everyone, to uh, our webinar, Fair Trade in the Floral Industry, as Georgina just mentioned. And I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, again, I am Alan Tenoy, Director of the Wholesale Channel Global for Floral Life. And my co host today, will be Mark Allen, the Global Product Manager for Floralife. Today's webinar will be an interview style format, a little bit different from what we've done before uh, with our guests from Fair Trade America. And as Georgina mentioned, there will be time at the end for any questions that you may wanna ask. Uh, they'll be very happy to take any of your questions. Uh, but the most important, before I forget, let me wish everyone happy Earth Day. I can't think of a better day to learn more about fair trade than today. I bet half of you didn't know that today's happy is Earth Day. So, um, Before we dive into learning more about fair trade, uh, which is the leading international fair trade certification, uh, let me turn to our co-host, Mark Allen, to tell us why fair trade is important to floral life and Smithers Oasis globally and how it fits into our larger sustainability journey. Mark, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, as Alan mentioned, I'm Mark Allen and I'm the global product manager here at Floral Life. But alongside that, I also lead our sustainability initiatives. Uh, and today we have a great webinar for you where we'll be discussing something called fair trade. But before we get into to fair trade uh, with our special guests, like Alan mentioned, I'd like to explain a little background on why we at Floral Life are involved with fair trade. So if we go back to previous webinars, which you can find at our YouTube page, uh, you'll have heard us talk about our Floral Life 2025 sustainability plan. And in short, it's, this is our sustainability journey, uh, which will be improving many aspects of the business in line with five sustainability commitments, climate change, water stewardship, uh, product portfolio, sustainable packaging, and then finally stakeholder awareness. And by the way, you can find a lot more information about these commitments at our website, oasisfloralife.com forward slash sustainability. It's just today we won't be going into too much detail about those as we're gonna focus more specifically on fair trade. I think Georgina, maybe you could share the, the link to our website in the chat. Okay, so, so next slide please, Alan. Okay. So in these five commitments, we have goals to achieve, whether that be reducing our packaging and saving water, uh, reducing waste and, and things like that. And, and one of those goals inside our product portfolio commitment was to receive our fair trade certification and launch a fair trade product range. And, and recently we did just that. So our fair trade certification is accepted internationally and, and we can sell our products obviously globally. And from this, we launched our flow life packets in a fair trade version in both liquid and powder format. And then also we launched a bulk storage and transport solution uh, in a fair trade version also. So you can see those products here on the screen. So you might be wondering what is fair trade about our products? And it's actually the sugars that's inside the product. So you may be aware flowers require carbohydrates to stay happy and healthy as they, they travel through the flower supply chain and into the consumer's homes. So the sugars inside these products are actually sourced from farms that are engaging in fair trade programs. And, and I won't get into too much detail about this here as we do have special guests to help explain. And by the way, we won't just be talking about sugars uh, when it comes to fair trade, but we'll also be talking about fair trade as it relates to growing cut flowers and everything that's going on inside that space or, or our industry. 
So inside of our 2025 plan, we talk often about the three pillars of sustainability, people, planet, and prosperity. And the fair trade products are very good at supporting uh, that people or that social part of the three pillars. So as I mentioned, we do have fair trade products available and your floral life always as representatives could certainly help you if you're interested in, in stocking those products. So Alan, I'll pass it back to you and we can, we can get on to learning more about fair trade. Okay, thanks Mark. Now let's dive into our topic today. Uh, we're lucky to have uh, with us today, let me change slides, uh, two representatives from Fair Trade America, as we mentioned earlier. First, let me introduce Stephanie Westgall, who is the Development Manager for Sustainability and Partnerships, thanks for waiting, at Fair Trade America, focusing on sugar and other commodities. Uh, Stephanie, Stephanie actually was my first contact with Fair Trade and helped us down the certification path, so thanks for that. Stephanie is a graduate in sustainable agro-tourism from George Washington University, which is in DC, and she has over a decade of experience in the food and beverage industry. And the sugar cane that you can see in her background is because she just got to move to Hawaii. So how nice is that? Uh, next, Michael Kakmas is Business Development Manager at Fairtrade America. Michael manages the Fairtrade flower sector, so he's the boss today, as well as other commodity groups like coconuts. Look at the link to Hawaii, coconuts. Michael is an MBA graduate, also from George Washington University, and received his BA in Supply Chain Management uh, from the University of Tennessee. So thanks for coming. Welcome to you both. Since we started our journey to, to our journey to fair trade certification about two years ago now, I guess, we have the sense that depending on where you are in the world, some people know a little bit more about fair trade products and buy them, uh, but others not so much. I would say that in my opinion, it seems like people in Europe are more a little bit more familiar with fair trade and but people in North America, the US, Canada, et cetera, maybe a little bit less. So today, uh, because the audience is mixed, we want to start high and introduce you to fair trade if you are a little less familiar with it and update you if you're more familiar. And of course, feel free to ask any questions at the end of the presentation. So Michael, let's start with you. Uh, why don't you give us a little background on fair trade and how it works? Hey. Thank you, Alan and, and Mark. Appreciate it. Excited to be here this morning. Uh, morning for me. Um, so I wanted to, to start, as you mentioned, to kind of level set, um, make sure everybody understands global trade's history, um, and then talk a little bit more about fair trade. So as most of you may know, um, global trade uh, it is, is a, has had a troubled past um, some of the supply chains um, are represented by unequal uh, historical um, activities and events such as colonialism, uh, exploitation, and extraction of those goods. In the early 1900s, we can see uh, some regions and a lot of the regions that our farms are growing in, uh, in the global south, they were um, exposed to things called banana republics. And I use this as an example, um, but in the, in the early 1900s, uh, businesses and governments uh, colluded to extract goods and harm the environment, um, really not uh, represent the, the workers that were there producing the products and harvesting the products. And this created deeply unequal and unfair trading practices. Um, the workers weren't able to represent themselves. Most of them didn't have contracts um, to get paid fairly. Uh, a lot of them had unsafe working conditions. And um, this is really the backdrop of where fair trade felt like it was uh, required to make trade more fair um, and, and to really uh, raise the the level of, of um, empowerment for workers and the pay for workers, and also make, making sure that a trade is, is being good stewards of the environment. Uh, so an, an example 
I like to share is that these unequal practices are still existing today uh, in the United States. For instance, we might be able to go to a local grocery store and you can buy a banana for 30 cents or 40 cents a pound um, that traveled 3,000 miles to get to that grocery store, whereas an apple might have traveled anywhere from 15 to 60 miles to your, to your local grocery store and the cost is twice as much. So the, the, the trade is still unfortunately unequal and that's why fair trade is really important uh, when it comes to trading on an international scale. Um, next slide, please. So because of these origins, it was imperative to a group of Dutch uh, businessmen in the 1980s, they traveled to countries and, and realized that a lot of these workers were in poverty. And in the 1980s, uh, it sparked the first fair trade label. This is, it was due to a crash in the coffee prices, uh, which led to a lot of farmers, thousands of farmers and workers being out of, of a job and out of a livelihood. And so this was really where the origins of fair trade started. And we, they, these gentlemen created a system to uh, have direct trading routes for fair trade certified product. Um, and nearly two decades later, we created the fair trade international system and label as you know today, um, you can see up in the right hand corner. And this system was founded upon principles of reducing poverty, improving labor standards and conditions and encouraging sustainable production. These principles are still the same ones as we operate on today and, um, and, and encourage for, for farming in, in all of the products that, that we work in. Next slide. So you might be asking yourself um, a little bit more about what is fair trade and, and these are some lofty goals. Uh, this is a, a lot of countries that we work in and, and uh, a pretty robust statement uh, to reduce poverty in the world. So how, how do we do it and how does it work? So I'll uh, address a little bit more about that. So again, our, our, our mission of fair trade is we are a certification system um, looking to change the way that trade works by paying prices that are higher for farmers and making sure they have uh, better prices. They are working in decent working conditions and they have labor standards that they uh, are able to work under. And there's a just a more fair deal for the farmers and workers in developing countries. Next slide. Some of the tenets that we work on, uh, the fair trade certification system is different from some other certification schemes that you might be more familiar with. But I wanna pick out a, a few here that are really critical to delivering the benefits to uh, workers and farmers for fair trade. The first one is the top one, um, the 50% producer governance. This is really important because what we find is some certification systems aren't actually providing the benefits to the intended beneficiary. And in our case, this is the farmer. So we wanna ensure that the decision-making process from uh, Fairtrade International based in Germany, all the way throughout the supply chain to our producer networks and our fair trade organizations represented in each country has the decisions that are made by not only businesses um, or fair trade international employees, but also the farmers that we represent. So 50% of our board is represented um, by farmers and workers themselves. Um, another aspect that I wanted to, to highlight here is the fair trade minimum price and the minimum and the premium. Uh, the minimum price is is a, acts as a safety net for farmers to be paid the sustainable cost of production. It's uh, more or less a break-even cost for when they produce something, if the market price falls so low, uh, it won't, it, the minimum price enables them to at least get paid 
what they need to um, continue producing that crop. And the premium is an additional sum of money that the farmers get uh, when they have a fair trade transaction. The offices that down at the bottom, our country offices are, we have 32 offices throughout the, the globe, uh, Fair Trade America being one of them. We are the US chapter of the international system um, based in, in Washington, DC. And there's 31 other national fair trade organizations. So you might be familiar. I know there's a lot of, uh, of attendees all around the world. Uh, if you're in Spain, you might be familiar with Fair Trade Spain or Fair Trade Belgium. Um, there's Fair Trade Australia. So we, we have those offices are all affiliated with the international system and they, they are uh, representative of, of our certification. And next slide. So this is an intricate picture. It's, it's a little complex, but I, I will walk you through it. It's a really great example of how everything comes together and how we all work. So there's 32 offices uh, is what makes up um, part of the system. And that can be depicted on the right-hand side. And these are the national fair trade organizations. Um, they, including our organization, the, the, um, the US chapter, we're responsible for developing relationships with external brands, with retailers, uh, grocery stores, and non-government organizations to educate and advocate consumers around fair trade. And we do that through facilitation of, of partnerships. Uh, we label the package and we administer the mark in our office. And then up on the top side is Fair Trade International. They're based in Bonn, Germany, and they are charged with bringing all of these actors together uh, under one roof per se. And they're, they lead the coordination of all the global strategy. They revise standards for products. They set new minimum prices and premiums um, when the, the cycles are up. And they're really the, the, the decision makers in the system. And um, right, so that's, that is uh, Fairchild International. And then on the left side, we have the producer network, which are a key component of fair trade of the fair trade system. These folks are your agronomists, the local experts in country, and managers that help with the implementation of a lot of the programs that fair trade um, uh, provides, the benefits that we provide to community uh, cooperatives and, and farms. So there's three producer networks uh, in each of the regions that we grow in. Latin America, Africa, and Asia, and the Pacific. And they are another critical piece in, uh, if we have training and education programs on the farm level, those are the folks that we depend on to train uh, our workers, uh, the fair trade workers at the, at, at our, at the farms. And then in the middle is FlowCert, and this is our single uh, auditor and they are the group that goes and aud the audits the producers, the manufacturers, and the exporters, and the traders. And it's a key piece here as well, because FlowCert and the Fair Trade Certification requires the um, entire supply chain to be certified so that we can enable transparency and traceability from the producers all the way to the last um, stage of packaging. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to cover on this. Okay. Uh, next slide. Let me jump in here, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, now that we understand the what and the how, that was a great explanation. Thank you. Uh, let's talk specifically about the flower sector, right? Since that's where all of us on the call generally work every day. So can you explain Fair Trade's program inside the flower sector? Yeah, absolutely. So it is, it is a robust system. Um, and how it relates to flowers is really, uh, it's an amazing story. And um, it, it works a little differently for each product. So uh, I'll share with you all uh, how it works in flowers. Next slide. 
there's a couple key components. Um, I have six of them listed, uh, but like I mentioned, fair, fair prices um, and environmental aspects uh, and, and stewardship are some of our key tenants. Uh, paying farmers a living wage is, is something that we are uh, buyer to do in our certification. And in one study that the World Bank conducted, they found that in Tanzania, the price of the price that workers were earning was 30% more than non-conventional farms. And in Uganda, the price that workers were earning was over 120%. So this is just one way to show that um, it reduces risk along the supply chain when it comes to labor rights, that uh, companies are making sure that they're paying a fair price to their workforce. Um, so risk management is definitely a key aspect of, of why uh, folks should engage with fair trade, along with securing social basic rights uh, for workers. They, we have 70,000 workers that are uh, represented for fair trade in flowers, and every single one of those workers um, is supported by fair working conditions, um, protections, um, at their job and security, and as well as some of the chemicals that they're using, they have to ensure that uh, you know it's it's safe to handle, it's safe to breathe. Certain uh, they have to wear certain protective gear when they're using that, and all of those criteria are in the fair trade standards. And the middle point is is really about um, in the United States. A lot of times, consumers think that flowers are grown you know, a couple, maybe a state over, a couple blocks, a couple streets over, um, but that's just not the case. In the United States, 82% of flowers are imported. So it's critical that we uh, import sustainably grown and, and fair trade uh, flowers. Next slide, please. So some of the other things that uh, it's, it's important to engage with fair trade flowers with is, as I mentioned, the payment to farmers, as well as, uh, women's empowerment in, in environmentally friendly practices. And I'll talk about a, a few of the, um, some projects that I wanna share with you in the next slides. Um, so we can just go ahead and move on to those. Um, as I mentioned, 70,000 workers are represented in all of our farms um, throughout the world. And there's 72 producer organizations uh, that are certified as fair trade. It's been a growing sector for Fair Trade International. We've been adding farms to um, our portfolio to be able to either have uh, new regions or new new flower um, new flowers added to um, to our products that we can offer. And you can see here that Kenya is the most um, is the the largest growing region. Um, by a pretty large uh, uh, um, margin and then followed by Ethiopia. And then the other, I wanted to mention too that 45% uh, of this workforce is represented by women. And that's a really important uh, aspect and something that we're really proud of because Fair Trade understands the uh, necessity to empower women to reduce uh, climate change, to improve um, working con labor conditions, working conditions, as well as um, reducing poverty in, in their regions. Uh, next slide, please. In 2018, uh, the flowers all over the uh, flower workers all over the globe earned almost eight million dollars in fair trade premium. And so, if you remember, one of the the key aspects of fair trade is the minimum price as well as the premium. And the premium dollars are generated through uh, every purchase of a fair trade rose or a fair trade flower. And this is a breakdown of how the fair trade premium dollars were spent in each of the uh, categories that we break them down in. And you can notice that 73% of the, in all the purple, that represents 73% of the, um, premium dollars were spent towards services for workers and their families. And this is for things like financial and credit services, um, education for the workers as well as for their families, 
and um, training on the farm for uh, professional as well as um, personal education reasons and training. Um, next slide. So $8 million is quite a bit of, of money, especially in, in uh, other regions and the impact is vast. Uh, and, and I wanna share some of the impact stories that uh, and, and some of the outcomes that Fairtrade is able to see based on these um, premium dollars as well as engagement with um, farmers. Next slide. First is the environmental reasons. Uh, we did a study in 2018 where we uh, assessed the Netherlands and Kenyan uh, fair trade roses to understand better what our carbon, product, carbon footprint is like in the production of, of uh, flowers. I think it was roses specifically. So you can see up at the top right in this graph, we, we tracked agricultural production, packaging and transport. And um, Kenyan fair trade farms were five and a half times less intensive, uh, less harmful on the environment. Um, and this is just an, another reason why I think it's really important, not just on the social side, but on the environmental side of how fair trade can support your um, support the goals of of um, sustainable development goals and environmental stewardship. Um, sustainable water management, like uh, Mark mentioned earlier, that water conservation is a key aspect, and adherence to a harmful chemicals list, uh, which we take into consideration, not only for the social aspect, but also the, the environmental side too. Next slide. Um, another project that Fairtrade does, uh, it's a program called the Women's School of Leadership, and this is a, a project, uh, a program where it helps women in, uh, learn business skills, negotiation skills, finance skills um, that they're able to implement in their business, but also in their personal life. And so you can see here uh, an, an example of uh, one of the farmers that went through and attended the Women's School of Leadership in Ethiopia. And uh, this was at Herberg uh, Roses. And she was able to reduce or to make a budget for her family, for her personal reasons, and not rely so heavily on credit uh, as she was struggling to pay some of her bills. And she learned these, these uh, really useful skills and tools in the, the uh, leadership school. And a lot of the women that go through the Women's School of Leadership take those skills and actually become leaders in their premium committees and in the organizations that they work in. Right now, there's <clears throat> four women's schools of leadership in the Ivory Coast, Ethiopia, Ghana, and Guatemala. And as I mentioned, uh, Ionesh is in Ethiopia. So um, she was a, a graduate of the Women's School of Leadership. Nice. Um, and then one more slide here. And I think it's, it's a quote by Ionesh, and she mentions how uh, when she grew up, her mother was a little bit uh, more rigid on traditional um, gender roles and said, you know, we, you need to stay in the kitchen and, and men are meant to go out. Um, and, and she teaches her kids, she thinks of them as being equal and, and they can both work on the farm, they can both work in the kitchen. And um, I think this is one of the, the examples of how women's empowerment can uh, foster uh, really great uh, communities and, and um, reduce poverty. And um, yeah, that's some of the, the impacts that Fairtrade is, is able to have uh, in collaboration with their workers on our flower farms. Perfect. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Very, very interesting. I think an impactful one you think about. I, when, at least when I started this uh, Fairtrade journey, I was just thinking about Fairtrade as a consumer product I'm gonna buy and I'm gonna, you know, I'm just, my relationship with Fairtrade is I buy a product and I pay a price and I feel good about it. I had no idea how fair trade had all these other uh, sustainable objectives, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's environmental or uh, the social aspect of it, like you just mentioned, right? So I think that was, that was a big learning for me and um, uh, it was really nice to see. But uh, now let's turn to Stephanie and talk about the commodity sugar. So as Mark was saying earlier, sugar is important. Uh, like, why are we talking about sugar uh, 
and flower, you know, flower fair trade webinar. Right? So sugar is important, uh, again, in the post-harvest treatment of flowers, right? It is the main driver of nutrients to cut flowers in it, which is essential to getting good base life, good consumer experience, people buy more flowers. So all those flower food packets that people are most familiar with in bouquets and arrangements contain, you know, a lot of sugar. So Stephanie, maybe you can enlighten us a bit. Uh, I just said that's a slide. Uh, enlighten <laughs> us a bit on how fair trade impacts the sugar trade. Sure, and um, I wanted to kind of start that um, sugar just has kind of a dark side and probably a lot of consumers, even on this call, it can be um, uncomfortable sometimes to talk about sugar. I think um, if you're familiar with fair trade, you might've been familiar with fair trade coffee or chocolate um, and bananas, but sugar is just something consumers just don't want to chat about. And it's actually quite a complex agricultural commodity and it's a huge agricultural commodity and can be in things like flower packets. Um, so we should be really talking about it. Um, and the, the dark side of these like the sweet treats sometimes or um, other commodity is that the prices are volatile and they're forecasted to actually decrease by 2025. So as you can see that with Michael chatting about earlier that the fair trade minimum price and premium is really um, to help farmers have stability in the market. And as uh, experts are forecasting that the prices are gonna decrease, this is needed now more than ever. And I think a few, a few people probably on the call have heard of you know, child labor and cocoa and it's been um, really highlighted by BBC, some other huge news uh, anchors throughout the world, but no one is talking about sugarcane. And what happens is, is when you have a low and volatile commodity such as sugar, you do increase the likelihood of child labor. Um, and that just comes with the territory of this. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it's really hard to have sustainable practices at the farm when you have such low prices. Uh, it's hard to invest back into your crop, back into the community uh, when you're not getting a fair price. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So where are we today with sugar and with partners like Flora Life? Well, if you think about sugar as a huge agricultural commodity, uh, but last year, the, the estimates are between 160 and 180 million metric tons for the global sugar. And so you can see that our producer groups all across the world only account for about half a million. And within this half a million of production, only 34% was actually sold on fair trade terms. You also have to remember that not everything that the producers can produce actually does get sold in fair trade terms. And why it's so important for us to have partners in the supply chain who are willing and want to do more uh, with their, their fair trade communities across the world. But even with this, last year, uh, the fair trade premium generated across the global system was 11.6 million. So this is a huge number just for um, thinking of how small we are in the scale of the global sugar cane system. Um, and wanted to highlight, uh, Michael had kind of talked a little bit about premium funds in flowers and 70% is spent on infrastructure. And this is one of the commodities that we do not have um, a, a minimum price in. And why that is, is because of a lot of countries have subsidies and laws that producers actually need to sell back into their local economy for sugar. Um, and so a lot of times the premium is, is voted by the cooperative itself and they want the payment to go to members with like a cash fund. Uh, so within flowers and sugar, I think uh, that the, the premium is being put back into the farm, but also sometimes does need to be a cash payment out to farmers as well. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And so as you can see with the complexity of uh, the sugarcane system all around, we really need to think outside the box with fair trade that um, our certification kind of needs to go a little bit beyond with some of our projects that we get investment from brands like Floral Life, as well as the premium working with the producer groups to think about how are we really gonna elevate the sugarcane system globally and how are we going to make some impacts where we think that we have some expertise and then also partnering with people who have expertise. 
And one of the really cool projects that we are working on in Mauritius and other fair trade sugar producing countries is really moving toward a climate smart cane. And that's a very loaded word. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, climate smart can mean so many different things, but really what it means in sugar cane is that um, three huge, three big things. And that is deforestation, uh, which is usually not talked about in sugar cane, but it is um, a slash and burn crop. Um, what I mean by that is you're cutting down um, old uh, rainforest to get more land for your crop. It is a very intensive crop. And then a lot of people um, don't know, but it's very, um, it's entrenched in a lot of cultures to do sugarcane burning. And so actually our standards do not enforce that you have to not do sugarcane burning um, because we haven't found a, a good and safe way in every culture that we work in um, for snake bites. And so a lot of times people think, oh man, uh, sugar cane burning, it's horrible for the environment. And sometimes they don't think about the people aspect of it. So it is something that the Climate Smart Sugar Cane is working on. And actually last year, Mauritius was able to um, complete the project with none of the cooperatives in that country doing um, sugar cane burning. So, and that's something that's really great about fair trade and the producer networks is that those producer networks share that across the globe. So these practices do get shared if there's pilot projects within each country. And then the third piece too, is that um, the premium is being spent back into the infrastructure of the actual associations or co-ops. So, and what I mean by that is some of the things that Michael touched on of women empowerment within the cooperative, what kind of leadership schools. And then um, the, there was also part of this climate smart sugar was in Belize. And they actually did a youth led child labor mediation and remediation program. And so I think that that's a huge difference that you see is that when somebody from the top is telling you to do something versus youth coming to the organization, uh, these are the children of the producers saying, this is something that we're advocating for and we're gonna teach the community about. And they have huge success with the program and it just, um, I think it's a positive light um, on how we're gonna move forward in the sugar industry. Next slide. And so with, the fair trade premium, um, sometimes it's hard to kind of grasp how it gets used, where is it being invested, um, and when you're buying products like Flora Life, um, how do you make sure that that premium is going right back to the producer um, groups? And I wanted to highlight um, an experience that I have personally, and then give you kind of um, one of our really big lofty goals, as Michael had called them earlier, of uh, with the SDGs. So next slide. So we work, um, we have goals in almost every SDG, uh, really wanting to highlight about them. And the biggest portion of premium usage in sugar for SDG is, it is for zero hunger. And so what type of premium usage actually does that really cover? And one big thing that I had mentioned before was those cash payments. So that would be included in the zero hunger SDG goal. But a few things that people maybe won't come to light right away is that diversification, um, which we'll kind of get into uh, when I did a visit to a sugar cooperative. So diversification of crops um, and also different types of sugar cane, uh, as well as another one is nurseries. So a lot of times, um, a lot of the nurseries, they would, in the past, producer groups would have to purchase from other people instead of having them themselves. And so that not only adds value for job creation, but it also adds value for teaching components, um, as well as just uh, having everything in an ecosystem that is fair and uh, can really help the community with things that I had spoken about before. And last but not least is uh, actually water conservation falls under this as well. So making sure that the sugarcane uh, infrastructure that they're putting investment back into the farm adheres to environmental standards that help water conservation. Next slide. Let me jump in here. Sure. A little bit. Uh, I'm glad you included this in the presentation, uh, this next part, because I think it's hard for people. We're so far away from the people that are we're trying to help, right? Like I was saying earlier, 
my experience was it's just a product and a price that you buy at a store and then you feel good, you know, after the, making that purchase, you think you're helping people, right? Um, but I think it's hard for people to really quote unquote feel something for fair trade products because they've never personally experienced the program firsthand. Um, so I'm glad you included this and um, maybe I'm hoping you can, in this next section, you can share a couple of stories about who the really the people are behind it and your own maybe share one or two personal stories about how you can see the program actually impacting their lives. And I think that might help everyone to uh, have that emotional connection, right, with the products and that it's not just that product impersonally you're buying, right? I mean, there's really actually things going on behind it. Thank you, Alan, for making that point, because I do think it's super important. And even working within the system for two and a half years, um, getting to go to a cooperative for the first time is kind of life changing. Um, if you ever get a chance to do an origin trip within your uh, work, I just, it's incredible. So I would really highly suggest it. Uh, so I had a chance in 2019 to do um, a couple of origin trips, but the one that stuck out the most to me was Quapa Victoria. And this is uh, one of our sugar cooperatives in Costa Rica. Uh, next slide. And why this one stuck out to me so much is because how much they've grown and really taken the program that um, of fair trade uh, to the next level for their community, not even within the association or slash cooperative. So the cooperative is now made up of 3000 plus producers um, that kind of service 50,000 community members. And that's among 10 different districts within Costa Rica. And this is a cooperative that produces coffee and sugar. Uh, so a lot of times people don't understand either that small producers usually are only producing in about, uh, about a hectare of land is pretty, is pretty average. So when they can collect and come together, they can get a better price. And then that premium, in addition to that, can be invested in a, in a bigger, more impactful way. Um, and just looking at this slide, just remember that thousand metric of organic sugar produced because this will be a highlight later. Next slide. And so they've been part of fair trade um, now for 10 years, but for nine years when this impact um, when I got the data a few weeks ago, uh, going all the way through 2020. So with nine years of premium, this cooperative alone was able to get 3 million in premium. So that is a combination of both sugar and coffee. Do keep that in mind. This is a, a dual commodity cooperative. Um, and with this, they have an umbrella premium program that they created themselves as a cooperative, uh, commercial uh, justice programming. And within this, it kind of has a couple of different branches, which I actually got to see during my visit there, which was incredible. Um, and one of them that I thought was huge and just, uh, I think we really struggle with is just the whole agricultural community is how do you get young people involved? How do you, how do you, if, you know, if I, if I see my parents making a low income, not gaining a lot, why would I wanna go into farming? And so they've started this new generations group, which I think is just incredible. And then, they started this um, two years ago. It's called Adding Ideas, We Change the World. And so they vote on every, everyone from the community. It's not just producer. Um, they open this program up and everyone can put in a call for projects and then the cooperative votes and then they give money and people go out and implement. And I'll show you a couple of those. Next slide. Um, so these are the ones that were picked for 2020. Um, in Costa Rica, there is a huge migrant worker um, influx during different seasons that come from Nicaragua and other countries that surround it. And sometimes those workers, they don't have a permanent ho um, house and they don't have the means for, for child or for um, childcare. And so this was, I think, a huge uh, investment for this particular cooperative for $8,000. You can see the picture on the left of what they built and have a childcare system for these workers that come in um, to help during huge harvest seasons. Next slide. 
This one is um, one of my favorites is because my brother actually lives in Costa Rica. And the first time I went down to visit him, I was like, where are the sidewalks? He's like, oh, I don't, we don't have sidewalks here. Uh, you just gotta, you just gotta <laughs> try and go up the hill on the road and don't get hit. I was like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's quite interesting for me. Um, and uh, I think this was just a huge step in the right direction. You can see how much the cooperative invested. I mean, 20,000 is, is huge. Um, but really helping the community um, for safe transit of people who walk to work and for exercise um, and just a, a happy, healthier life all around. Next slide. And so when I was speaking about that one, uh, the 1,000 metric tons of organic sugar, they had invested a huge amount of premium um, in previous years when I was there in trying to convert some land into organic sugar cane. And making the conversion to organic products in general is not an easy feat. And I think sometimes uh, traders just think that, oh, you can just do this in a year, you'll be fine. And it's not that simple. A lot of work and a lot of testing goes into this. And so when I was there in 2019, they were still in the process of trying to get the production up to speed. So it was just really great when I caught up with them a few weeks ago that uh, they're what they were able to produce a thousand metric tons. And while that doesn't seem like a lot when you think about the global scheme, when you're thinking about these producers and how much time and money they spend, it was just a huge, uh, a huge win, I think, for the cooperative. Next slide. And I just wanted to end with this slide is that um, a lot of people think that um, their supply chain or supply communities um, are, are always uh, living in poverty or that they don't know how to um, associate, they don't know how to be leaders. And this was a trip that really proves that wrong. And as you can see, that is the building uh, for the cooperative as well as the two main leaders uh, of the cooperative in terms of uh, the left is for coffee and the woman on the right is um, their sustainability leader. So she has a lot of like the nursery programs. Um, she is probably the best YouTube uh, video watcher I've ever in encountered. She just gets information from all over and she helps the producers uh, disperse that information throughout the community. And if you see me on the right, that is me trying to put a sugar cane stock into the wow. mill itself. And I wanted to highlight this because there was a huge, a huge uh, pile of them. And the, I, of course, tried to pick up the biggest one first and I couldn't lift it. And so we were all laughing that um, I would never make it as a sugar cane <laughs> producer. <laughs> but just to go to show you that um, what they do is incredible. Um, and I just, it was a really warming experience to know that what we do and the partners that we have throughout the globe really do make a difference. And so Mike, next slide. Yep. Michael and I really want to express um, our thanks to Flora Life for having us at this webinar. And then also for everyone on the call, uh, whether you're a business professional or a customer, we really encourage you to be part of making trade more equal. Please do use our emails. Like you can contact us anytime. Feel free to reach out if you're interested in partnering with Fair Trade. And definitely next time you're at your market or grocery store, uh, look for the label and choose fair trade. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Stephanie and Michael, uh, for sharing your knowledge and experience and passion, I would say, I would add, about fair trade. Uh, and a little bit, which is very important, I think, uh, about your own personal connection or personal experience uh, about the lives that the program actually touches. So thanks for that. Let's see. I have a, uh, you, you don't know I'm going to do this, but I have a final question just real quick to follow up on your last point. So that was very appropriate. If someone in the flower business wanted to get involved in fair trade to help these growers and communities around the world, if someone's listening to this webinar right now and is motivated to do something, to participate in the good work, what's the best thing that they can do? I think the <clears throat> the best thing if if they're interested in sourcing flowers is that weird. Um, yeah, whatever you think would be the best. Yeah, yeah to participate. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I think the best way to participate is is as a consumer is to make sure that you're you're purchasing fair trade uh, items. Um, I think voting with your dollar is really important. And then as a business, uh, contact your local um, national fair trade organization. Um, reach out to them. Almost all of our NFOs are, are there to support and do everything that we can uh, to create market access for producers. Um, so we have. Uh, contacts with traders that are already certified that we would, would love to share with, with anybody uh, interested in um, sourcing fair trade flowers or sugar um, or any of the other products that we certify. Stephanie, you want to jump on with anything? I think that Michael covered it and like we really do. I mean, um, I think all of our offices around the world um, really do mean like you can contact us anytime with any question. No question is a dumb question. Um, I think that it's, uh, it's a very vast uh, industry to get involved in and just making the first step uh, can be difficult and kind of um, confusing. So please use this as a resource. Okay, so, awesome. I, I just, so let me, so the next thing is uh, I suspect uh, good segue that some of you on the webinar would like to know where you can find fair trade flowers and uh, fair trade America was very uh, generous in allowing us to put out a list of both the producer organizations and the sort of farms and a list of the traders what's called traders and so this is a link uh, we put together where we posted both lists so you can, you can go to that, this blue link um, at our blog and you can find both documents uh, on that list and it's quite an extensive list. Uh, and then um, another thing for advocacy, I think would be if you wanna participate and some of your suppliers that you buy from are not participating in providing fair trade products, ask for it. Tell them you just heard about this program, it's fantastic you want to buy fair trade flowers, why aren't you carrying that product for me, right? I mean, ask them and that might trigger some, some change in the supply chain where more traders will get involved in the fair trade product. Okay. So, oh, so, so Alan, we have a few questions from uh, the chat. And by the way, anyone still on the call, if you have any questions, feel free to, to post them in the comment section. So one of the first questions for you guys is, how do you ensure that the contributed money is indeed going to the workers and not staying with the owners of the farms? I can take this one. Um, that was kind of what Michael had spoke about, those, those three sectors off of the Fair Trade International parent branch. So FlowCert being the only auditor that we work with um, does an audit from the producer group all the way to the end brand. And that is exactly what they look for is making sure that what we call a trader who's the premium payer is actually paying the premium. And that um, there's whatever upstream from that, that the input is the output. So that if they're reporting to us that they're purchasing one metric ton of whatever commodity, that they're only selling one metric ton of fair trade out. Um, so it's really um, a mathematical check. And then also at the producer level, um, the audits are a little bit more intense because there's a lot of more standards that um, need to be looked at at the farm level as well to make sure that the premium is being voted on democratically, um, that not one person is making those decisions, um, as well as that they are receiving the premium. I see. Perfect. Um, second question. Does the Fair Trade Organization provide marketing packages to help uh, retailers promote their Fair Trade flowers or, or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got uh, a lot of different materials in different languages that are um, uh, associated with different countries uh, and, and kind of the cultural context there. But uh, Fair Trade America, as well as any of our other organizations, have uh, marketing material that can help um, explain and educate some of the retailer buyers and consumers about what projects are working on and, and the impact that they have. Definitely. Awesome. Okay, a another question. Um, so at, at a certain point in the presentation, you talked about how your contributions uh, impacted the SDGs. So one of the questions is, what is the SDGs that you referred to? 
the sustainable development goals. I think that um, uh, Georgiana uh, had answered that, in, but I can go a little bit more in depth. Um, so we have been uh, very involved in the meetings that go on for the SDGs when the World Bank, when the UN meets, uh, they always have NGO partners who come in to kind of report back on the goals, as well as where we are year to date. Um, and so we are very heavily involved in those meetings and we do report out on them on the Fair Trade International website. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then is there any more? Oh, a question for Floref. Can you again go over the different fair trade products that you have available? Yeah, of course. So we launched uh, to start with uh, our packets in both liquid and powder format in express formula. But that does not mean we couldn't do any other formula. But we start with our express formula. So that's both packets, um, powder and liquid, in half liter or one liter we can make available. We also launched in, a, in our express clear ultra 200 storage and transport solution in a fair trade version also. We started with the 20 liter size, but that does not stop us from going any size from 250 mil all the way up to 1000 liters. Well, I think that's eight ounces all the way up to 264 gallons over in the US. Okay, Is, uh, Georgina, do you see any other questions? Or are we good? Nope, that was it. We've answered all the questions and it's perfect timing. <laughs> Yeah, we managed to get in uh, at the right time. So to close, I guess that brings us uh, to the end of the presentation. Uh, I just want to thank our speakers, Mark Allen from Floralife, Stephanie Westell, and Michael Katniss from Fairtrade America. Uh, thanks for your time and expertise and for educating us on the good work that Fairtrade is doing. And to our listeners or participants, thank you so much. I know you're busy people. Thanks for coming and participating in the webinar. And I hope that this inspires you to go out and purchase a fair trade product or, or find out where you can get some fair trade flowers. So with that, thank you very much. And that, that would be the end of our presentation.